This is the T33, the second car from Gordon Murray Automotive. We sat down with Gordon to hear all about the new car and how it differs from the firm's halo model, the T50. Gordon, lovely to see you again, and it's great to be here at uh, your new Windlesham headquarters. Um, and we have a very beautiful new car behind us as well. It doesn't seem it was that long ago that we were talking in front of a T50, and obviously many people have seen that car at Goodwood now, shrieking and wailing its way around the, the circuit. So clearly things are moving at pace at GMA. And now you have this. So it's been, I imagine, a very busy period. Um, before we get into specific details about this car though, can you give me a, a, some background to it and the ethos of the car and how it fits with T50 as well? Yeah, sure. Um, there's a couple of big sort of starting points really. One is this is a car I've had in my head for decades actually. I've always wanted to do a motor car that picks out all my favorite 1960s sports racing car features. No, not retro in any way, shape or form, but actually just uses those, those shapes and brings them into a modern form. So that's always been hanging around long before T50 actually. And the other one was our promise to everybody was that T50 would be our halo car. And of course, the central driving position, sub thousand kilos, 12,000 revs, it really is. To follow on though from that, and of course we promised we'd never make more than 100 cars a year, so when T50, the last T50 and 50S rolls off the line, we have to roll on to the next one. So this is something the team and I have been talking about, you know, what, what the next one should be. And moving on from T50 in not a different direction because the seven core principles in GMA apply to anything we do, absolutely anything we do. So once again, a supercar with no real influence from what other people are doing, just what, what we feel would make a great little good looking motor car um, that people would want to use. That's the background really. Well, if I may, I'm going to start mm. with the design because mm. um, not only is it a very striking car, but it's also for a supercar, a car that looks different to what is the perceived norm of, of supercars mm -hmm. um, out there at the moment. So, and I know you've got, as you've already hinted, strong views on the design. And, um, so, yeah, if you could maybe explain to me that philosophy, why does it look the way it does? And I suppose inevitably then we'll have to talk about aerodynamics because mm -hmm. clearly that's sure. a big part of that. Yeah, so as I said already, we don't, we don't follow trends and there seems to be a trend now within the supercar community of trying to make the next one look more and more outrageous just for the sake of it, really. And we didn't want to follow that at all. We wanted to do a nice pure motor car, like, like 50, mm -hmm. using classic shapes and curves and something that will look good in 20 or 30 years time, which we hope 50 will as well. It's all about A, not following trends, but B, doing a car that's a genuine, what I call a genuinely styled motor car. So there's nothing on this motor car that doesn't have a function. You won't find a slot or a louver or a fin or anything that doesn't actually have a function. And that's really what GMA is all about. So we have our own say over everything in the company. We're not, you know, we're not, we have got layers of management. So if we decide to do a car that looks like this and is styled and designed in this vein, we can do it. And I have a fantastic team of people. My creative director, Kevin Richards, and myself go back more than quarter of a century now. So we think the same way. And we have a great team in the studio. So turning something that was a concept in my head 20 years ago, 25 years ago, into reality has been, has been fun. So given the performance of the car, which we'll come on to talk about uh, in a minute or two, um, how, how does it stay on the ground? Clearly there's, there's not <laughs> big spoilers and there's not, especially at the front, there's no jutting splitter, but you're yep. obviously managing that airflow very carefully. Yeah, it's got very interesting aero on it actually. First of all, uh, it doesn't have quite the same downforce as 50 had. The 50 was a very special motor car. And of course we don't have the fan, but what we learned in the months and months it took to develop the diffuser shape with the fan was with the very steep kick we have on 50, where we draw the air out with the fan, and force the air to follow that. We found, when we found once we developed the kick point and the shape of that diffuser, when we switched the fan off, it was still effective. It dropped about 70% of the downforce, but it was still about 30% better than a conventional 
ground effect car. Yeah. So we started, banked that one, and started developing uh, a diffuser shape that would still, nowhere near as violent as, as 50, um, but would still uh, use the base suction behind the car to suck air out on the kick point of the diffuser. So the benefit that gives you, instead of giving you the, the resultant downforce around the rear flank of the car, it gives you the downforce around the sort of B-pillar bulkhead area, which means you're much nearer the centre of gravity, so you don't need unsightly and ugly front splitters and aero devices. To make front downforce, we do have two diffusers, but they're hidden in the front wheel arch on mm -hmm. this car. Mm -hmm. um, but, but the main reason why we don't need a lot of um, ugly aero on the front is, once again, it's the, uh, it's the sort of boundary layer control. Although with a fan, it's fan assisted, of course. With this, it's passively controlled. When you walk around the car, it does feel very compact and mm -hmm. low. Um, is that a fair assumption? It is. It's, in fact, um, it's 35 mil longer wheelbase than 50, because mm -hmm. we, once you don't have central driving position, of course, the occupants move back 250 mil or so. So we needed a bit more wheelbase to mm -hmm. fit the occupants of the fuel tank in. Um, and the overall length is about 40 mil longer, mm -hmm. and the width is exactly the same. So this is exactly the same footprint as a Porsche Boxster now. Quite something, given the, the performance of the car. And underneath that skin, again, different to mm -hmm. T50. Mm -hmm. but, oh, completely different architecture. Mm -hmm. And yeah, different method new. as well. Yeah. Uh, indeed, yeah. So this is what we call Superlight, our Superlight architecture, mm -hmm. which, which is based loosely on our iStream, GMD iStream technology. And it's, um, it's a combination of an aluminium frame, but cored, you know, sandwich carbon fiber panels in the occupant area and the engine bay area to give you a, a, like a Formula One style safety cell. So you have, a, you have the benefit of not having to try and having a central tub and bolt on aluminium frames because the bolted joints are, are flexible and quite heavy. Suspension, that's different again from T50, new wishbones, things like that. Yeah, all the suspension is new, front and rear. It's just an architectural thing again. It's not that we thought of something better. It's just the, the fact that um, the crash structure on the front is much wider than 50 because once again, that was just a foot well wide mm -hmm. with the central driving position. So the geometry for the front end is completely new. Mm -hmm. And we took the opportunity to repackage the rear end as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned crash testing because this car as well is um, federalized for sale in the It's US. fully federal, indeed, yeah. yes. I think um, whereas the T50 was show or display, mm -hmm. uh, like most um, low volume cars are into the States, we thought, we thought this time we'd bite the bullet mm -hmm. and um, we'd go for full federal, which gives us a, globe, uh, a global car, a car that you can sell anywhere, basically. It does add 28 million pounds to the development program, which is <laughs> it bring, brings you out in a cold sweat to start with. Yes, yes, I can imagine, I can imagine. Well, uh, the other thing which I think everyone will be um, very keen to know about, and it's over there on a stand, is the engine. Mm -hmm. And this, once again, is a naturally aspirated V12, which I'm sure many people will be very excited about. Um, it is part of the same family as the engine that was in mm -hmm. uh, the T50, but with substantial revisions. What can you tell us about that? Yeah, so obviously the, the base engine, the GMA, uh, Cosworth GMA base engine is exactly the same, so it's the same block and crank. Um, but this one's had reworked cylinder heads, uh, new camshafts, obviously very different mapping on the variable valve timing, completely new induction system and exhaust system amongst uh, other things like engine mounting is different. You can't, the engines aren't interchangeable, for example. Um, and we've done that because we've knocked a thousand revs off the top down to 11.1 instead of 12.1. Mm -hmm. And Cosworth have once again done a magic job of making the engine very, very drivable. The car's still light, it's under, under 1100 kilos, so although it's a little heavier than T50, um, it's it's still very, very light in the sort of supercar genre. Yep. And uh, Cosworth had done a great job by making the engine even more flexible. I mean, the 50 engine is, now that I've driven it a few times, is ridiculous. You know, it makes 70% of the torque at 2,500 revs. This makes 75% of the torque at 2,500. Right. And when you've got a maximum torque of 451 Newton meters, it actually makes more than 400 newton meters from 4.5 to 10.5. So 
so the tall curve's just about flat. Yeah. And it's, um, that's, that's an advantage of knocking a thousand revs off the, off the top end. Right, right. So a little bit less power than yeah. the T50, yeah. but a little a bit lot more... Wider torque spread. Wider torque spread. Yeah. Right, and you mentioned that weight figure. Is that a DIN figure with fluids, with, with fuel? That's, yeah, so uh, we, we always weigh cars with what we call showroom. So it's all the fluids you need to go apart from a fuel, full tank of fuel. Mm -hmm. So uh, we don't do dry weight. That's, motorbikes do that, you know, we don't, <laughs> you don't do dry weight. You can't drive a car without water and oil and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. And another new gearbox as well for this car. Yes, yeah, so to make this, a, 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 appeal to, let's say, a slightly broader audience, because the, the T50 was unbelievably, as you can see, focused. Uh, while this is still driver focused, we wanted to make it appeal to a slightly wider audience. So we're offering it uh, full federal, as we've talked about, mm -hmm. left and right hand drive. Mm -hmm. um, and people, when you say that with 100 cars, people throw up their hands in horror. But actually, if you design that in from the beginning, it's not as horrendous as you, as you imagine, you know, as long as you've designed the the left and the right hand drive together in the basic package, it's fine. You know? yeah. So left or right hand drive and an option on the gearbox. Standard is six speed manual. Mm -hmm. And then we have an option of a, a, an extract gearbox with a paddle change, which is a new system they developed initially for their um, touring car racing. Mm -hmm. And we've using on T50S. Right. So it's called an instant, it's, it's an IGS, instantaneous gear shift mechanism selection and it really is instant because it's actually a pre-select the box right uh, we're just looking at the figures at the moment but it's got a good it's a good chance that it'll be the fastest gear, gear change on the planet right. <laughs> so we go from the sublime to the ridiculous you've got an h pattern manual or the quickest gear change on the planet you know. <laughs> how do you think it will play out in terms of sales what, what's your well, prediction well we've it's that's a really interesting question and actually a slightly embarrassing question because um the car's been quietly on pre-sale, very, very quietly, and we've already sold more than half of them um, before the launch. And so far, we've only got, I think, 5% uptake on the paddle shift. <laughs> so we could find ourselves in a situation when we get to the 100 cars after the launch, hopefully, where we've got just a handful that are our paddle shift. Yeah. But we've, we've promised we would develop it anyway, so... Um, yeah, yeah. And is that a single clutch, that gearbox? How many, what sort of... Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a, a single clutch, clutch box, box. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but it's a pre-selector, so it's already in the next gear. Right, mm. right, hence the speed of the change, yeah. obviously. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then, in terms of the interior, it's back to a conventional two-seat, side-by-side yeah. layout. But I know, again, that it's very much your philosophy, or your team's philosophy in there, in terms of an absence of, shall we say, modern touch screens and things like that. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, we, we, have, we have very modern interface. We have Apple CarPlay, of course, or Android. Um, we have all that, you know, off your phone. But from the point of view of the tactile primary and secondary controls, once again, everything's machined from solid aluminium. Everything's analog. All the secondary controls and some of the primary controls are rotary, mm -hmm. uh, no touch screen, two information screens, and still the big 120 mil uh, taco, mm -hmm. the, uh, everything's floodlit, no back, no backlighting through plastic. Mm -hmm. Very much a driver-focused motor car again. The same ethos as 50, you're just not sitting in the middle. And once again as well, um, I know you won't have forgotten about luggage capacity and, and that kind of side of it, and I imagine for a mid-engine car that's pretty well Yeah, we, we've gone, once again, we've gone, <laughs> pushed the boat out a bit. 50 does pretty well. It's, um, it's about 220 litres, I think, with the, or around 200 litres, something like that, with the side lockers, which goes up to about 280, if with two people, with the mm -hmm. suitcase and the passenger seat. This has three luggage compartments, one in the nose and two in the rear flanks, uh, with a total capacity of 280 litres, or six cases. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and that is, um, well, that's the same as a small patch. Yeah, and, and sort of picking up on that as well, I know we were talking earlier, clearly this is a car that will have lots of track performance, but once again it's a car um, in the sort of spirit that you've become known for with road cars, where it is very usable, Absolutely. ground clearance, yep. good ride quality, yep. you're aiming for those kind of things. Yeah, lots of wheel travel, uh, not, not a ridiculously high natural frequency from a springing and damping point of view. Um, 
uh, yeah, good ride height, so you don't need nose lifters and stuff like that. Um, very good visibility. Once again, an incredibly low scuttle like the 50, so the, the forward visibility and the side visibility, very, very good. Mm -hmm. This time, conventional mirrors, because we don't have the issue with the central driving position that we had, where the mirrors would have been on 50, they would have been on top of the front wing, which looked horrendous. Yeah. But this time, yeah. with the left and right hand drive, we can put the mirrors in a more conventional position. Yeah, yeah. Um, and in terms of time frame, you're moving to prototypes? This summer, this summer, actually, yeah. I think it's around June we start putting the first cars together. Mm -hmm. So really exciting. So we'll be driving them this summer. Um, mm. And production is right at the beginning of 2024, so yeah. just two years from now. For me, what we were trying to do, I, I know this sounds slightly silly, but if you only ever had to have one supercar to use, this would be it. Because it's, it's practical, it's usable, um, well, like T50, the maintenance costs are relatively low, servicing mm -hmm. costs are relatively low. It should look good in 20 years' time, 30 years' time, and you've got that glorious little uh, four-litre V12, you know, the, the world's best V12. We can now categorically, having driven it now, <laughs> we can categorically state, you know, it's got that behind you as well. So I couldn't have imagined it turning out any better, to be honest. It may be a more conventional car than the T50 and a very, very slightly more affordable one at £1.37 million pounds plus taxes. But the T33 certainly promises a spectacular analogue driver's experience like few other cars. <laughs>